Resistance Group leader, or me. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Cynthia Nations. Okay, next slide. So now we'll begin our uh, presentation. And I want, to, I want to introduce, before we start our presentation, I want to um, um, thank Melinda Martin and Sandra Firpo and uh, tell you a little bit about them before we start. So Melinda Martin started as a fire inspector in 2012 with the San Mateo uh, County F uh, Consolidated Fire Department. And she was just recently promoted to deputy fire marshals. We want to congratulate her for her promotion. She was put in charge of the wildland urban interface inspections. And she currently advises HOAs and homeowners on pro proper management of properties in the WUI areas. She uh, currently gives presentations and town hall meetings to promote wildland safety and awareness. Melinda is also a member of the Fire Safe Council of San Mateo. Sandra Firpo is an emergency service specialist with the San Mateo County Fire Department. She works uh, out of their Office of Emergency Services and does most of their public education programs, including CERT, Get Ready, CPR, and first aid classes. In her past, Sandra was a lifeguard, a clown who would entertain at uh, kids' parties, a broadcast journalist, and a puppy raiser for guide dogs for the blind. Sandra spent most of her life here in San Mateo County with the exception of two and a half years which she lived in on, on a cattle ranch in Argentina. So now uh, I'm going to, um, next slide please, we're going to um, turn it over to uh, first Melinda Martin. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Cynthia, for that lovely introduction. Um, so yes, so I will start off the presentation and then Sandra is going to follow up with her couple of parts. Um, she's going to talk about preparedness and I'm going to talk about just the state of the state of the union, really, um, just what's going on with the fires, what we saw this last fire season, and then home hardening. I know that was a request from your group. Um, but yes, if I would like to uh, request that we hold questions till the end, just so we can get through the presentation. And then if you have questions at the end, Sandra and I are happy to answer those. All right, so we can move to the next slide. All right, so California's fire season from the front line. So a lot of this was taken from a presentation put together by Cal Fire, um, Battalion Chief Brian Hamm. So I'm not gonna take credit for this part of the presentation, but I thought it would be very interesting to share some of the statistics and things we learned from the fires this last season. You can go ahead and forward, please. So the Dixie fire, um, as you can see, we hit almost a million acres from that fire alone. Um, it, it went through multiple counties. The biggest piece, the takeaway, I think, for your association is just it was timber fuels that were burning. So those are heavy, dense fuels, which is why we had the spotting. Um, spotting is when the wind carries flaming embers ahead of the main body of the fire, and those little fire brands or embers start fires ahead of the main body. So that's actually one of the ways in which these wildfires spread so rapidly. Um, so we had a lot of long range spotting and then we had very heavy, <coughs> dense timber forests burning. Um, there also was very poor access because I'm sure any of you folks that have been up in that area, it's a very unpopulated mountainous area. Um, we don't have a lot of fire roads, very steep terrain. So that was a big issue there. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. So the suppression efforts, so this actually stood out to me, the 465 miles of fire line. So that's basically from Chico to Los Angeles. That's the fire line that the firefighters had to try to control around this fire. I mean, that is a lot of ground when you think about it. Um, there was big issue of smoke. So aircraft, aircraft is very valuable in firefighting. Unfortunately, you can only use it when the conditions are right. And the conditions were not always right during these fires. There was a lot of thick smoke, pyrocumulonimbus clouds, which are created from the actual fire itself. Um, that you've probably heard of fire weather and that's what a pyro, pyrocumulonimbus cloud is. It's created by that incredible heat meeting the cold air. And so they create these huge billowing clouds that create um, thunderstorms and more wind. So that was a big issue. Um, and then also crew fatigue. Um, you have to remember when we go out on a fire strike team season, they used to only be about three to four months long. Now it's year round. So crews get really tired, really fatigued. It's very common now 
that folks will, when they go out on fires, they've already been out in another fire for about a month and they're getting transferred from fire to fire to fire. So that crew fatigue is a real issue now um, in the fire service and something that we're dealing with. We can forward to the next slide. Okay, environmental factors. So I think this picture is pretty telling. Um, so we had, again, overloaded fuel conditions, um, you know all about fuels, just a lot of uh, ladder fuels, shrubs, coyote bush, things that are actually growing up and around the trees that can bring the fire from the ground up into the aerial branches of the tree itself. Um, again, it was very hot and dry. We didn't have any rain, wind change direction constantly. Again, inaccessible terrain was another huge factor here. And the wildland, so WUI stands for Wildland Urban Interface. And that refers to homes that abut onto open space to basically open open land, open space. So that's what that acronym means. We can move forward. So that was the Dixie. This is the Keldor fire. So the Keldor fire was the one that started near Pollock Pines and went all the way into the Tahoe Basin. So that one was pretty crazy. And that actually ha was happening concurrently to the Dixie. One of the reasons that fire did not get um, they didn't weren't able to control it early is because all of the crews were deployed on the Dixie. So they basically had to take crews that were already up at the Dixie and they had to reroute them down to Caldor. So that's part of why it took so long initially in the initial battle. So again, resources were, again were very depleted at this point. They had been committed to other incidents. Um, and then there's a hierarchy in how we get resources. So again, it goes state, local, federal. So it just depends on where we are in the actual queue. And so the, the Dixie was getting more of these resources essentially. And then Caldor got assigned once those people became available. We can move to the next slide. Okay. So the suppression efforts, um, again, the resources, as I mentioned, um, aircraft. So anyone that's been up in that area that's gone Highway 50 up to Tahoe, that's kind of a unique area. There's a lot of little valleys there. It's not like one continuous mountain chain. There's a lot of rivers, little valleys, um, canyons that cut all through that area, which made it very difficult because basically the smoke would trap in those areas and aircraft couldn't fly because it was just, you couldn't see anything. Um, the high elevation. So this is something that I think a lot of people, it opened a lot of people's eyes. So again, if anyone's familiar with that area, the topography changes very rapidly and you get a very rapid elevation gain. Usually like around strawberry is where you really start to see it. Um, so we had crews that were going up there that were coming from sea level. So you can imagine going from sea level to almost 10,000 feet. That's going to be a bit of a change um, in your ability to work. Also, there's lack of water. Um, there are lakes up there, but there's not a lot of accessible water um, for firefighting, so that was challenging. And then again, because of the slope, they couldn't really deploy the bulldozers. So the bulldozers, I believe, and I'm just I'm off the top of my head, I think they can go in slopes up to 25%, but anything over than that, over that, they can actually be at a risk of rollover. So they could not deploy those to cut fire lines like they had in other fires. So that definitely became a big part of the challenge. Next slide, please. So hot, dry conditions, overloaded fuels. You know, again, anyone who's gone through that area has seen just how dense that the undergrowth and that shrub, that shrub, the shrubs had become. The wind changed direction, and a lot of that had to do with those canyons and just the way the wind was going. The wind was constantly; it was coming from the east, the north, the west. Um, and then they also had spotting. Um, again, and that's where the fire, the embers float ahead of the fire and start new fires. So there was a lot of that on this one as well. Next slide, please. So the take home message. So I don't, I don't have to reiterate that with this group, but evacuate when ordered. That's a, that's a huge part of it. I think that sometimes it's very heartbreaking for folks thinking that their home and everything that they have and they've worked hard for is potentially going to be destroyed. But at the end of the day, when you evacuate, it makes our job easier. We're better able to fight the fire. We're not taking up resources, now making sure that someone can get out safely. So that that's kind of the take, the big takeaway I want everyone to get from that is if you decide to stay back, you're potentially taking resources away from actually fighting the fire. So I always reiterate that. Um, defensible space around structures. I know this group is very familiar with that. Um, and again, we'll 
I don't think we'll talk about that too much, but if you have questions after, I can definitely discuss that. Um, knowing your zone. So Sandra's going to talk about that. Zone Haven is a fantastic resource that we've just had become available to us. So she will talk about that as well as having to go back, access and egress for fire equipment. Um, again, this doesn't probably doesn't apply to most of you, but then if you're living in a real rural area, making sure that it's very clear where they should go. If your house is in danger, really having your addresses posted. If you have a water tank showing how many gallons it has, if you have a little fire road, making sure that you're improving it, that they can actually get down that road. And then plan to be evacuated for extended periods. And Sandra will touch on that as well, but don't expect it to be like a three day, oh, I'm gonna come back after three days. I know the poor folks, um, my parents actually have a house in Pollock Pines and those poor neighbors, they were gone for almost three, four weeks, some of them. So just be prepared to be gone for an extended amount of time. All right, let's go on to the next one. So home hardening. This is this is my one of my favorite topics to discuss. You can go on to the next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna play this awesome video and this is from the National Safe, Safety and Health Institute. This is a really great video that just demonstrates what actually can happen to a home in a wildfire. They actually built this house in a warehouse and then they blew embers at it and you get to see what happens. So you can go ahead, uh, Peggy, and play the video. You just click on it there. Yeah, just click on it. I'm not seeing a, uh, a video here. I'm sorry. Oh, can you try clicking on it? I am clicking on it. Oh. Um, do you have access? You have the access to the internet. That's weird. I wonder why it's not going. Hmm. Okay. Well, that I can give you a link to it after after the presentation. It's a really great video, but I'll just I'll just link to it so we don't take too much time. Okay. Yeah, we'll do it the next slide. So basically, I like to show that video because it, it's easy to talk about the next slides, but that's okay because I've got some really great pictures here to the right that you can see that I will talk about. So there's many parts of homes that are vulnerable in a fire. Um, and a lot of times people think, or initially we all thought the homes were burning down because the flame front was coming through and actually burning the homes. We've done a lot of research in recent years and we found that that's actually not the case. Most of the time it is by the embers. The embers go ahead of the fire they're landing on these homes and that's actually what's starting the ignition sequence. That's actually what's getting them started and ignited. So that's, um, that's, that was kind of a big thing that we, that we found over the last five to 10 years. A more recent finding, which I will touch on in this presentation from the campfire, is that even having structures or vehicles near a house can actually also start a fire and start that, that process of ignition. So we'll first start with the roof. So the roof, I'm sure most of you have a non-combustible cement asphalt or sh uh, shingles. You have, um, or you have slate if you're really, if you have a really nice roof or not, and some kind of a non-combustible roof, that's ideal. Wood shakes obviously are the worst because those are wood, they ignite very easily. Um, so again, I won't talk about, I won't read off the slide, but if you want to read all the information, we can also make this presentation available to the members too, if you want a little bit more information afterwards. So vents. So if you look over on the pictures to the right, you'll notice there's, especially on the top one, there's like a little vent right there under the eaves. So those are roof eave vents, and they usually are there for the attic space to get air, to allow air to circulate through that area. Unfortunately, a lot of older homes have one quarter inch mesh. And so the problem with that is it's big enough to allow embers to come into that attic space. And once you get those embers in that attic space, they ignite usually the insulation and then off to the races. So that that's usually how, what we've noticed from past fires, how fires start. And it's actually a very easy retrofit. Um, I will show you a, sh a sheet at the end of this presentation that links directly to Cal Fire's webpage that show that tells you all the retrofits you can do. But one of the easiest things to do is use one eighth to one sixteenth inch mesh. Um, you just pull those old ones out and then put the new ones in. So very easy um, retrofit to do. Um, and then we have eaves and soffits. So basically the eave, it's right there on the top there. You can see that's an eave. Um, a soffit is basically very similar. Um, usually it's in more of an inside of a building, but it's usually where there's an overhang. 
Um, so what we look for in the fire service, you want a boxed in Eve. So neither one of these is a boxed in Eve, but a boxed in Eve basically means you have no rafter tails and you have no space, no, um, no vents underneath to allow fire to come up underneath and actually intrude into that attic space. It basically is just a clean whole piece of wood that has no openings in it whatsoever. So I can, again, if you want more information on that, I'd be happy to send it to you after the presentation. Let's do the next slide. Okay, here's some other really great pictures. So you can see um, there was an aluminum boat on that first picture on the left, and you can see how close it was to the house and how it, that by actually having that boat ignite, how it could have very easily gone up into the eaves. Um, if you look, then these are, the, this is the same house, the middle and the next picture. You can see the damage that was already occurring to the fascia board underneath. You can see how there was some charring. There was some intrusion. It looks like it didn't, it may not have made it all the way in, but it was on the way, on its way to actually making it into that attic space. So you can see how having exposed eaves can really be, um, it can definitely be a weakness for the house. Next slide. Okay, windows. So I feel like, I think probably most of you have double pane or tempered windows, but this, these pictures just really great. They illustrate what can happen. Um, this one, this one on the top, I believe is a single, it looks like an aluminum frame. You can see how the blinds already started melting and the fire actually was fairly far back from this house. I want to say it was at least 10, 15 feet back and you can already see that radiant heat. Uh, the picture below, you can see all that melting kind of along the side. That was a vinyl window and you can see how the vinyl just melts straight off. So if you live in a wildfire prone area, they recommend against using vinyl because even for gutters and, um, and down pipes, because it melts, it'll just, it'll melt straight off and actually ignite anything combustible on the ground. Um, so yes, if you live in a wildland urban interface, consider dual pane. Um, now, if you're required to upgrade your house to wildland construction standards, you actually have to have a tempered exterior pane and that tempered glass helps to prevent that heat intrusion for longer. So those are actually specialized windows now that you will see um, if you live in one of those areas and you do construction or you replace your windows. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so this was a really great takeaway. This one really got me too. the decks, gutters, and fences. So you can see how something as benign as a fence, if installed incorrectly or made of the improper material, can actually convey fire all the way back to a main structure. So if you look at these two pictures here, the one on the left, that's a wood fence and it's connected to that metal structure there. So you can see how the fence is actually ignited. That tree is now igniting. And now in the picture on the right, look at that structure. So that, that fire basically ignited that wooden fence and it traced it all the way back to that home. So they, the recommendations are, if you have a home in a wildland urban interface, that you do not have a fence connected to your house. That you have it around the house rather than actually connecting. And if you do have it connected, you would use something that was non-combustible in between the combustible part and the house. Um, so decks, same thing. I know a lot of us have decks. So an important thing with decks, Oftentimes, I see this a lot in Belmont because I, I serve cities of Foster City, San Mateo, and Belmont. People that live at the tops of hills, they have these big, beautiful decks because they want to get that gorgeous view. But the problem is they have a huge opening under the deck and they're at the top of the hill. So you get a fire that comes up that hill. All of that heat and smoke gets trapped under that deck and starts to heat up. It heats up that wood and gets it to its ignition temperature and now the deck's on fire. And because the deck's connected to the house, now the house ignites as well. So that's something to think about um, if you are in one of these areas, it's think about doing non-combustible decking would be great. Um, another thing that's actually very helpful too is if you live on a very steep slope, having a retaining wall made of non-combustible material down the slope. So if the fire does come up from below, it's hitting that wall and it's actually banking it upward away from the deck and away from the house. So that's another way I've seen it done that works pretty effectively. Rain gutters. So again, I think it goes without saying, try to use non-combustible, don't use vinyl if you live in one of these areas and clean them out. I know your master gardeners, you're probably all very on top of that with trees and all the debris that gets clogged in the rain gutters. But yeah, it's, it's really important, especially if you live in one of these areas. Next slide. 
All right, walls and siding. So here's another really cool takeaway. So the pictures below, the one on the left, you'll notice there's a structure and there is a vehicle. So that vehicle actually was directly next to that house. Um, actually, a bulldozer came along just in time, saw that, that the house was about to ignite and moved the car out of the way. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see the damage that was already occurring to that house by having that vehicle so close. Thing, this is some of the, the, the things, the takeaways from this campfire that we've really that we saw a lot when we started doing the investigations up there is that even things that we couldn't wouldn't even think would be combustible ignited. And then because they were in such close proximity to the main house, they were igniting the houses. So sheds, ADUs, your neighbors, um, you know, if your neighbor has like a structure that's right on your fence line these things can actually ignite your house if they're not properly spaced apart if you're in a wildland urban interface so it's it, that was a really great that was a really great takeaway i think we we've always known about it in the fire service but actually seeing it it really brought that take home message and then also you saw in that other picture the boat right next to the house we wouldn't really think of a boat as being a combustible source of ignition like an ignition source but in that case it almost ignited that home so Good takeaways to have if you're in an area like that, just, you know, and, and some of these things may not be able to be fixed right away, but just good to get sort of thinking about that and really just take in consideration. So, as I mentioned, walls, um, even having walls, if you're in one of these areas, hardy boards, a pretty common material. Um, I see a lot of people doing concrete and stucco now. They're not always the prettiest, but there's actually some really cool stuff you can do. I've seen some very decorative rock details and things that folks have done. So, yeah, there's definitely options out there. Let's forward to the next one, please. Okay, so as I promised, this is the low cost retrofit list and this is actually available on the website. I think Sandra has the link for this and she can give it to Cynthia, but this is available, publicly available and it's very easy ways that you can retrofit your home. So if you're, I'm sure you're think you're getting a little overwhelmed. Oh my gosh, I've got all these things. I've got the vents, I've got the deck never fear. It's okay. It's you just, you take little bits and pieces and work on them year after year. So I think the easiest thing really for anyone to do is caulking. So caulking anything where it's got an inch, a one, one sixteenth inch gap that's greater and like around garage doors, around windows, very easy and cheap to do and vent covers, very simple and easy to do. And then down the road, doing the bigger items like windows, um, decks, fences. But yeah, if you just have like a punch list and work through things and do a chip away at it little by little, it's actually very doable. So I just want to leave you with that idea that this is not, you know, don't be overwhelmed. You can do these things. These things are totally attainable. You just got to create a checklist and go after it year after year. This is actually a really good um, segue because we have a great video for you to show you um, Sandra will be showing you this gentleman that actually did this over a period of years, retrofits on his house, and how effective they were. So I will let uh, Sandra now take over, and um, I will see you all for a question and answer. Thank you so much, Belinda. That was great. And uh, I want to thank the uh, Master Gardeners for the invitation to have us with us. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see it. My congratulations also to all the spotlighted members. Um, I know that you guys give a great deal of your time and talent to the community. So let me play this video. Yeah. And why others bargain. When we were evacuated, the fire was coming up out of the canyon. And we stopped down the road and look back this way, I, I wrote it off. I said, there's no way our house can survive. But weeks after evacuation still displaced, Roger Wells and his wife Mary turned on the news and miraculously saw their house still standing. I about fell through the floor. He was laughing when he saw the video. <laughs> oh, holy <was> smokes. <laughs> Walk with them in every direction outside their house. Nothing but charred remains of what so many families called home just weeks ago. There's plenty of evidence the inferno made its way to the Wells doorstep too. There was ash and pine needles and all in here. The fire had been in here, but it didn't light up the house. The former logger believes it's because two years ago when he retired, he started hardening his home. He sealed it so embers can't get in. 
replaced a wooden deck with synthetic planks, installed a fire resistant roof and siding, and cut down trees. We took down 14 trees that were too close. We opened it up so if there was a fire, it wouldn't be on top of us. Had you not done all that, do you think this house would be standing here today? No, if, two years ago, this house would have been gone. It would have been like my neighbor's homes. Roger also made sure to keep his insurance company all state updated on each home hardening improvement. So not only is his home safe, his annual premiums have also stayed at $1,200 a year. Steve Moeller bought his house in Auburn built hardened from the ground up. Our house can't burn. It's got sprinkler systems inside. It's um, non-combustible material on the outside. The roof is fire resistant. But State Farm, his property insurer for decades, couldn't factor that in at renewal time. It went from $900 a year to $9,000. And uh, I didn't want to pay that. He was able to find a specialty insurer, Rivington Partners, that after physically inspecting his home, offered a $2,300 annual premium. That includes a 10% discount for home hardening. But according to this El Dorado County insurance agent, that's rare. The fixes are broken right now. Aurora Millette says very few property owners are getting breaks. In fact, quite the opposite. She has clients that do everything to harden their home, only to see their insurance double and triple. With the lack of progress that we're seeing, I believe it's going to get worse before it gets better. We're going to have more insurance companies that pull out. You lost your house? Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara admits it has been a challenge. I'll tell you, in all the counties that I visited and the meetings with consumers, the, one of the biggest um, issues that they bring up to me is the fact that they'll have an insurance company come in, an agent, and say, you need to you know, do these hardenings, and then they still get dropped from their, from their policy. He says he's working with the industry to come up with new home hardening standards that if will guarantee a discount for property owners. Similar to the good driving discount that insurance companies already do. We want to encourage people to do the right thing. Steve Moeller wants to see that too. His Firewise neighborhood group recently met with the commissioner seeking advice on how to convince insurers to do the right thing. We're hoping that as we get more organized as communities and we do more work um, reducing fire risks, that the insurance companies will recognize that. Back in Grizzly Flats, Roger Wells hopes his story of survival will inspire both insurers and homeowners. Anyone that lives in a force should take the time and effort because they're vulnerable. You're thankful? Oh, yes, oh. we're thankful. <laughs> you bet. It's a mess inside and out, but it's cleanable. You know, in a month or two, we'll be back in business. A spokesperson for the insurance industry told us it is working with the state to come up with the new risk guidelines using technology driven models. The insurance commissioner wants to get the new rules out before the next fire season. In Mill Valley, Kenny Choi, KPIX 5. So, as you can see, uh, home hardening is a very effective method. This this particular home, which I believe was the uh, was in the Calder fire, uh, directly in the path of the Calder fire, and his home was the only one to survive in his neighborhood. Uh, so let me proceed with the rest of my presentation. So thank you very much. We want to talk a little bit about personal preparedness, your personal and household preparedness. Uh, this is uh, something that I may. Uh, the, the sheet, by the way, that Melinda referred to, the low cost retrofit sheet, and this uh, a lot of this information is in a packet of um, a digital packet that I've sent off to, uh, to all of you that I think will be shared with all of you. So you'll have that at your disposal. So we've broken it down to five easy steps that you can do to be prepared. A lot of times when I talk to people, they'd say, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't devote you know, an entire weekend and hundreds of dollars to, to be prepared. And we want to talk to you about making it part of your, your lifestyle, your routine. Uh, so we've broken it down into five things. Get alerts. We'll talk about that. Making a plan. Packing a go bag, which Melinda uh, mentioned. Uh, building a stay box, your kit at home, essentially. And helping your friends and neighbors get ready. Next slide, please. So in terms of alerts, uh, there are... Uh, messaging, alert and messaging uh, systems in every county, certainly in California. Here in San Mateo County, where uh, we are, it is uh, SMC Alert. If you're in San Francisco County, it's called uh, Alert SF. Uh, so please, consider if you haven't already uh, got this on your, on your smartphone uh, or in your email, please considering 
uh, please consider enrolling in SMC Alert. And I'll give you all the websites and everything on a separate page so you'll have it conveniently done. But essentially, this gives you uh, a tool of information that you can use to decide what is best for you and your family at the time of any uh, event. And these are the types of um, the types of alerts that you might get on this messaging system. Next alert, please. Next slide, please. Then Zone Haven or Know Your Zone. This is a game changer. So what they've done is they've taken, let's say, this, the county of San Mateo and broken it up into small zones based on population. So some areas might be larger because the population is more uh, sparsely populated. Denser areas are a smaller geographical zone. Regardless, what happens often when uh, we have evacuations, for example, and we're asking a particular area to evacuate, they'll say everybody northwest of Main Street and southeast of I don't know my north or my south at any given time. And certainly when I'm very nervous and it's an emergency, I'm not gonna be able to figure out if my address or my current location falls within a particular evacuation order. So what by breaking everything into zones and encouraging people to know their zone, now they can say, let's say SME002 and E003, we want you to evacuate and we want E004 to please shelter in place. Well, now I know I'm in four, so I'm sheltering in place and I'm in, or I'm in two and it's time for me to go. Makes it much easier because now all of our professional responders say that, you know, fire, police, Department of Public Works, everyone's using the same map. And these, are, these maps are available to you and me as a lay person in the community. So wherever I am, I know my zone. I have it posted at work. So this, this template is on the Zone Haven website, which I will give to you, so don't worry. Uh, the, uh, you can take this, you can print it out, you can put it on your fridge, you can put it on your work cubicle. Uh, you can, you know, when I go on vacation, if they have Zone Haven, I look it up and I find out what zone I'm in and I make sure to post it there. So I'm aware of what zone I'm in. And when they send out an alert and they include a zone, I know whether or not right? That's just as valuable, whether or not my area is impacted. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk a little bit about the so-called go bag. Like its name, it's a grab and go bag, okay? This is not everything you can possibly own and carry. This is something that every individual in your home, including your pets, should have, and they should be able to carry their own go bag. So if you have children, it's not gonna be a super heavy bag, but you want things in there that are helpful to them and of comfort to them, same as with your own go bag. Um, so if you have, for example, a particular allergy or a particular dietary need, you wanna make sure to have some you know, food bars or something in there that you can eat. Because if you imagine, in, let's say a, a regional disaster like an earthquake, of course, all of the government agencies and everybody's going to work towards you know sheltering and feeding everyone who's displaced and who needs assistance but it's going to be whatever food we can get whether it's pizza sandwiches you know the restaurant down the street they may not have a great variety of foods particularly in the first you know three to four days so you need something you can eat especially if you like i said you had a particular allergies or dietary needs a phone charger, you want a backup power source in your go bag. You're not going to remember to plug it, you know, unplug it from wherever you have it at home. So having that extra charger is always a great idea. Your personal medications, again, pharmacies and, and places where you can get your medications are not going to be uh, working and up to speed in the first few days after a major disaster. So having uh, a stock of your own medications and certainly a list of what those pres prescriptions are, are very helpful. If you have any medical devices, whatever you need to run those uh, and extra of what you need. Uh, notepad and pen, remember the, the cell phones aren't always gonna be working. Uh, so going old fashioned, old school is good. One thing that's not on this list that is also old school and really handy to have is a paper map of your area so that you know uh, how to get around. Uh, we say cash and small bills, why small bills? Uh, because let's say um, you know you want to purchase a gallon of water from me. Okay, great. I'll sell you this gallon of water uh, for two bucks. Okay, easy. All you have is a twenty. 
I'm not giving you my change. Cash is king. So you've just spent $20 on a $2 bottle of water. So again, give yourself more flexibility, more options, and small bills is one of them. Um, something that will entertain you, uh, whether it's your, your, you know, your sewing uh, project or a book, deck of cards, whatever the kids like, something in there for them for in their uh, go bag, consider that. We all have to carry masks now, but certainly uh, in a wildfire situation, the masks will also um, uh, protect you from smoke, um, the smoky air. And garbage bags are a fantastic and very easy, very light thing to always carry. Garbage bags not only work for you know, storing garbage or sanitation needs, but can work as a great poncho uh, or something warm uh, to, to keep yourself um, out of the elements if you need to be. So next, uh, next kit, please. So this is the slide I was talking about. You might wanna take a picture of this slide because it has all of the um, websites and, and resources on it, uh, the SMC alert. Again, if you're in San Francisco County, it's called Alert SF, and you'll find that very easily online. Uh, to find your zone, you literally will plug in your address and it will take you to your zone. You'll see the map of your zone, but you'll also see maps of all the others. And it has a lot of good information in regard to uh, prepare, preparedness as well. And that template that I was talking about that you can, uh, that you can uh, print out and have a handy. One thing I want to touch on is, uh, and this is something simple to do, and now you'll be better prepared tonight than you were this morning if you if you do this, is develop an out-of-state contact. What happens is right after an emergency, say an earthquake, what do we all do? We all jump on our phones and we're calling each other because we're worried about our neighbors and our loved ones. That's the biggest concern we have. But ironically, uh, these aren't going to work. In a, in a regional disaster because everyone is calling each other. So the bandwidth goes down to nothing and you can't get through on a voice call. And so how frustrating is that? Because now you can't even reach your loved ones to find out if they're okay. But long distance calls have a better chance of working. So for example, I have a brother in Arizona. He is our, our out of state contact. Everyone in my family knows that if there is a regional emergency and we can't use our phones or can't get through to each other locally, call my brother in Arizona and give him a quick update. Hey, it's Sandra, we just had an earthquake. Uh, I'm fine, I'm at work and I'm going to stay here. And then when other people call, they'll be able to hear how I am and I can check back in with him in an hour and he will have heard from more people and he can give me an update on how everyone is. It's not as satisfying as speaking directly one-on-one -on -one to someone, but if I can get in an hour or so some information that'll sort of calm me down, help me focus, now I can focus on what I need to do next instead of worrying about what might have happened to someone else. So the out-of-state contact, uh, certainly a huge and very simple thing to do. Be sure everyone uh, in your area knows who your out-of-state contact is. The Disaster Ready Guide, uh, this is the Spanish version, but this is a really terrific uh, publication put out uh, by the state, Cal OES. And I have this digitally for you in English uh, in the packet that, uh, that I sent off to Master Gardeners. And you'll get that along with the low cost retrofit sheet uh, and a couple of other great items. So please, please look for that. And then social media, use your social media uh, to follow some reliable sources in your area that matter to you uh, and always have good information because that's the tool that you're going to use to decide how you're going to move next. What works for your neighbor may not necessarily work for you. Uh, that's why you wanna have good information coming in so you can make the best decision uh, for you and your loved ones. Next slide, please. That is the end of my presentation. So I wanted to thank you again for the invitation. And if you have any questions uh, either from the chat or um, follow them out. Melinda and I are here to, uh, to help you with that. We do have a lot of classes that we offer through San Mateo Consolidated Fire, our jurisdiction. We proudly serve the cities of Belmont, Foster City, and San Mateo, uh, but we can certainly direct you in, in your areas wherever you need uh, assistance. Well, thank you, uh, Melinda and Sandra. Uh, we would like to have the link to uh, Melinda's video. Uh, it 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 really uh, rang, um, you know, it really uh, resonated with me when I saw that video about how dangerous fires are. 
So we want to thank you and uh, that um, your PDF file was sent to all master gardeners and trainees yes, um, last evening. So thank you so much for helping us. And we're going to do um, answer questions at, at the end of the master gardeners part of the presentation. So next slide, Peggy. So as master gardeners, how can we prepare our homes uh, from fire and still maintain a beautiful garden, employing all the horticultural skills we've learned? And how can we share this information with our communities? Jack Hohen, PhD, a research physical, um, physical scientist, uh, retired from the US Forest Service, showed conclusively and repeatedly with thousands of studies that the best way to pr protect homes from fire is by creating a defensible space up to 100 feet around the home. Most of the wildfires that destroy homes are ignited by wind-driven embers landing on flammable materials close to homes or blowing through open vents. And you will be able to see this um, very clearly when we share um, Melinda's video. This part of the presentation addresses the defensible space zones, mulching and plant material, and how your landscaping practices uh, can uh, be firewise and still maintain curb appeal. So on the next slide, defensible state, uh, the, um, these are our action goals for defensible space uh, that uh, Lisa will talk about in a minute. Defensible space is a term used to describe actions to take in zones around a home that involve the careful selection of uh, location and maintenance of vegetation and other combustible materials on a property. Minimize the pathways of wildfire to burn directly to the home. Reduce radiant heat exposures to the home and structures. Reduce the uh, potential for embers to ignite vegetation and other combustible materials um, adjacent to the home and provide a safe place for fire personnel to defend the home and allow safe routes for evacuation as Melinda mentioned in her part of the presentation. So Lisa is going to talk about defensible space and, and um, what it looks like. So landscaping for fire is really a radical change for all of us. We are as gardeners wanting to have things look green and beautiful and lush. So we really need to start thinking very differently about the areas around our house. Even the area around our garage, our shed, that includes the decks, the stairs, and the landings. So you wanna think about this first zone, zero to five feet around your house as the non-combustible zone. Um, think rock mulch, learn to love flagstone, learn to love stone pavers, so if any windblown embers are coming into your house, nothing is gonna ignite there. Also, you really don't wanna have foundation plantings. You don't wanna have a shrub or a bush next to or under your windows because when those catch on fire, they heat up your window and then the window is just going to break or explode and catch your house on fire. Um, you don't wanna have any arbors attached to your house. You don't want to have any trees or tree limbs hanging over your roof. You want a 10 foot clearance away from your roof. So you want to think about keeping this area really clean. So removing leaves and twigs on a frequent basis, relocate any firewood that you might have, propane tanks, barbecue grills. Um, in the event of a fire, you want to locate any fiber doormats, any patio furniture, you want to put those combustible things inside, and even your garbage or recycling containers when a fire threatens. Next slide, please. So in that zone zero to five feet, in some cases, folks have low growing ground cover. So you can think about um, like in this photo, there's Diamondia, which is really low and really flat growing, but you want to keep this well uh, watered because any dead leaves or debris that's going to blow into this by the wind is going to catch on fire. So keep that um, little zone very lean, lots of succulents if you have something that you want to put there that's not going to catch on fire as quickly. And as a rule of thumb, the more vegetation you have present in this zone zero, the more likely this zone can become compromised, resulting in emission of the vegetation. So for zone zero, think non-combustible. Next slide. So moving out 
word from the house. Zone one is your five to 30 foot zone. So think of this as your lean and green zone. So you wanna make sure you have leaves, twigs, branches routinely removed. Remove any branches from the trees back 10 feet from your house. Keep your lawn well irrigated and create space between shrubs. So you wanna create groupings of plants in this five to 30 foot zone. And for your trees, you wanna remove any ladder fuels. So for a tree, you wanna make sure that you prune your tree up um, 10 feet up from the ground so that you don't have the lower shrubs catching fire and then spreading the fire into the trees. Many of us don't actually have this five to 30 foot zone around our houses. So you may have to work with your neighbors next door. So coordinate with them. Next slide. So moving out your 30 to 100 foot zone. This is the important zone for you to reduce the fire spread into the crown of any trees that you might have. You wanna create well-spaced planting groups and thin your trees so that the branches of the treetops are at least 10 feet away. Re again, remove fire ladders under trees. So if you have a shrub under your tree, if it's a one foot high shrub, a two foot high flame bank is gonna be under that tree if it catches on fire and then move into the crown of the trees. So you wanna make sure you limb your trees up, keep your grasses mowed within four inches maximum and be diligent to remove all fallen leaves, needles, branches, twigs. And again, we don't all have this 30 to 100 foot zone or area around our house. So you're gonna to have to work with your neighbors um, to make sure that you have your whole neighborhood in a fire safe manner. I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie to talk to us about mulch. This is gonna be my uh, very brief talk about soil and mulch. So um, for zones five through 30 and beyond, amending garden soil with compost, also known as organic matter, <clears throat> is essential for landscapes in fire prone areas as well as non fire prone areas. Um, compost absorbs water and holds water in soil and this allows plants to survive the long dry summers. Compost is rich in slow release nutrients, allowing plants to establish quickly, grow bigger roots with less fertilizers and water. After you add the compost um, to your beds or pots, you can add mulch, a thin layer of wood chips about one inch um, in, uh, in depth around the drip line of the plants. <clears throat> this is the least flammable mulch application. As wood chips decompose, they will hold in the moisture resulting in less water use. Wood chips suppress weed growth, growth, they feed the soil and this will result in healthier roots and plants. Mulch and compost together help plants survive drought, wind and wildfire. Taking care of the soil is, is important given climate change, less rain and longer wildfire seasons. Compost and mulch can be applied two to, time, two to three times a year. I have just scratched the surface of these two important topics. Um, there, there is much that goes on beneath the soil. Um, and I just, I just wanted to make a note, uh, let the master gardeners know that to be, be sure to check out the um, upcoming CE events and CE webinars eligible for CE hours on the VMS homepage. And I wanna thank Janet Gilmore for keeping the spreadsheet current. But our Top Notch Soils group offers a series of new presentation, soil presentations taught to the Master Gardener trainees for 2022. And you can also uh, learn about, uh, kind of refresh your introduction to horticulture, water management, pruning, entomology, and these are all eligible for CE. So anyway, thank you. Um, and I'll turn it back over to, I guess, to Cynthia. Right, and um, uh, Maggie will also now talk okay. about, uh, um, she will talk, the next slide, we'll talk about uh, fire resistant uh, plant characteristics. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, just say that um, 
wouldn't it be great if there were fireproof plants, but there, but there aren't. Uh, apologize for the uh, fireworks in the background here. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but the characteristics of plants that are fire resistant, uh, one is that they tend to store water in their leaves or stems. Um, they produce very little dead or fine material. Um, and very important is that they possess extensive deep root systems for controlling erosion. Um, they maintain a high moisture content with limited watering. So they're, you know, tend to be drought tolerant um, and they grow slowly and need little maintenance. Um, so when you have something that grows fast, um, it produces a lot of vegetation, which ultimately is going to um, dry out or need um, need pruning out. Um, so what you want to look for are plants that that don't do that. They grow slowly and they need much less maintenance. Um, they tend to be uh, low growing in form and they contain low levels of volatile oils or resins. So things like rosemary, unfortunately, as much as we love it, uh, and manzanitas, as much as we love it, um, <clears throat> tend to have higher uh, volatile oils or resins and they can go up like torches. So, so those need to be placed in, a, in an area where they're farther away <clears throat> and also low growing areas uh, un, not under, you know, where they can catch or create a ladder fuel situation. Um, <clears throat> they also have an open, loose branching habit. Um, so things that are a little bit more open, um, you know, little, little spaces between the branches are also uh, to be considered. And an overall low volume of total vegetation. Next slide, please. So here are some examples. Um, the, the manzanita is, um, it has a lot of the characteristics, as I mentioned, but it does have um, high volatile oils. So careful placement of, of the Arctostophilus species um, uh, is, is, is key here. Um, um, some others, um, some of the perennials that are, are dear California poppies are, are great plants for low growing options, very little water, <clears throat> um, low volume. They, they kind of go away when the water goes away. Um, uh, things like uh, coffee berries um, for evergreen shrubs. Um, um, California buttercups, ranunculus are, are great. Uh, yerba buena for ground covers, great. Uh, and our evergreen trees, the coast live oaks, they're, they, they have lots of wonderful characteristics. They tend to, they're, they're very, the dense bark um, helps to um, keep them from going up like torches, uh, you know, like a lot of other trees. <clears throat> uh, some of the deciduous trees like Western uh, redbud are, are great options. And next slide, please. <clears throat> so. Okay. Lisa? Yeah. So this is kind of a, a great before and after presentation of looking at all the trees on the left hand photo that are hanging out in that little area versus the right hand where you have your zero to five feet non combustible zone. Think about putting those pavers that rock mulch around uh, your house and your little garage space. And then in the five to 30 foot zone, that's your lean and green zone. So you can see how they've created little groupings of plants rather than having so many plants and so many treetops next to each other that will just allow the fire to move quickly onto your house. And then there's the 30 to 100 foot um, area beyond, which is where you wanna ensure that there's no crown fire moving from trees to trees and having well-spaced groupings. So again, you're gonna to have to need to work with your neighbors in order to make this all happen. And I'll turn you back to Cynthia. Okay, so protecting your neighborhood. Do you know that I can already tell, I, I read the email from um, Alexandra um, Dixon uh, last evening uh, about her problem with a neighbor. And I also see Margaret Warren's questions uh, in the chat box. And I can, I can guarantee you that many of us are sitting here saying, yeah, right, what's gonna happen um, because of our neighbors, because most of us don't have that large space. And, and um, 
if you look, um, if you look at the pictures, um, I have, you know, especially the one on the right, that that is how my neighbors, um, uh, trees have like overgrown our our uh, property and uh, we live on a slope and um, it, it was even worse on the side actually I have been able to take care of the problem and I had to um, do some good talking with my neighbor uh, I was fortunate now those trees are gone because he moved and he said I could do anything I wanted to so I had my gardener actually go over there and take down all the trees that were growing against the fence but not everybody has this wonderful uh, opportunity where your neighbors are actually leaving and, and he didn't care where they're, actually his yard looks great now uh, because he, um, I gave him a lot of fire, um, fire safety, um, you know, all of this that we've been presenting and uh, he, he retrofitted his whole uh, garden, which was so just great. Um, I'm glad that happened, although it did, cost a lot of money to take down those trees and I had to pay for my neighbor's trees. Uh, it was definitely worth it for me uh, not to worry so much anymore. So if you don't have a hundred uh, foot zone or, or more around the house, um, we have to uh, do something about our neighbors. One of the, um, we actually had to brainstorm a lot of this because it was, some of these suggestions were not uh, found online or in any research. So one of the suggestions was to invite neighbors to an outdoor picnic to discuss ways uh, to protect the neighborhood. Uh, in the invitation include fire safety information to provide everyone with the background knowledge for the discussion. This is what I did with my neighbor who was moving. Invite the fire department to attend and walk around the neighborhood to provide recommendations. And so what we're going to do with my, the neighbor on the other side uh, that lives on the other side of, of my home, uh, we also have people in the back uh, and we do have a lot of trees in our area. We're going to just have like just a little, uh, a little um, I don't know, get together uh, when it warms up a bit uh, uh, to do this, to um, invite everybody and give them the background information and see what they can do around their, their own um, homes. And then maybe that will spread to the other neighbors. We're very optimistic about this. Um, there are some, uh, some of your neighbors might be uh, ill and or elderly and can't get out in, uh, to clean up the yard. Another suggestion is to uh, get together, get the neighbors together and, and help clean up their yard for, for them. Um, I hope that this presentation um, has helped um, help you decide or, or help learn. I know that we all learned on our little um, Firewise group, we, we've learned a lot. Uh, and I even did that whole thing with my neighbors. So uh, hopefully we can, uh, we will share that Firewise presentation from Melinda because it really shows what happens with wildfires. Uh, so now we'll uh, entertain your questions and Lenny um, will um, facilitate uh, the questions. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Cynthia. And thank you, everyone. What an incredible presentation. And it's so nice to kind of have a to do list of things we can do to protect ourselves. So we did have a couple questions come in. Um, two of them came in during Melinda and Sandra's time. And um, let me just see. Yeah, uh, Alexandra did have a specific question about acacias on her neighbor's property growing over the fence. And she's asking now whether acacia trees present a higher risk, that are they especially volatile? And I think that question is for any of you, including Melinda and Sandra. So I actually have the list. Um, I do believe acacias are on the flammable list. It's actually, I should send that to you as well, Cynthia. There's some really great resources from FireSafe. They actually have a whole section on their website. I believe acacias are, but does anyone else know off the top of their head? If, you sh if you'll share that list with me, uh, I will definitely share it with everybody else when we share the video. We'll do. I believe they I'm gonna are. look it up. Yeah, I believe they are. Things like Scotch broom are also very flammable. Yes, yes, that one definitely is here. Let me look it up right now while I have it. 
Um, Melinda and Sandra, do you have any other suggestions about what we do with neighbors other than what we've uh, explored? And actually, I was just uh, had a lucky situation, even though it did cost a, a kind of a lot of money to chop to get rid of those trees that were there. They weren't uh, they weren't great looking trees, by the way, either. So <laughs> <laughs> anybody else? Have, do you all have any other suggestions about what to do in neighborhoods? I do know this is Susie Larwood and I uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I do know that acacias, in particular, the black acacia is on the list like eucalyptus for one of the most dangerous one, uh, trees to have in, for fire. So um, it definitely, it's black acacia. The other acacias and the golden nettle, which looks a bit like acacia, uh, the yellow acacia, um, are not quite as bad as the black acacias. And those get to over 40, 50 feet. Uh, so they could become huge and they're extremely invasive. They're also on the invasive plant list or tree list. Um, thank you. Uh, can I, are you ready for me to move on to the next question, everybody? Um, we had kind of an in-depth question, three issues from Margaret. Three issues, is anything being done to require San Mateo County citizens to expedite action on reports of dead trees on private property, to expedite approval of tree removal and to remove or reduce the permit costs? As two examples, it took nearly three years for San Carlos to require the removal of two obviously tall dead pine trees on private property. And the cost of a city permit to remove a tree tangled in PG&E wires on private property was over $300. Not everyone in San Mateo County is a multimillionaire. These issues can act as disincentives for homeowners. The third issue is that the recommendations that trees be at least 10 feet from the house and or other structures is often impractical as most of the lots in the county are around 5,000 square feet. So I know that's kind of a lot for you. This came in Melinda and Sandra during your presentation. Thank you. So I, I think I can, I can take this one. So yes, so Margaret, they're actually, I can't speak to the rest of the county because we only serve cities of San Mateo, Foster City and Belmont. But I know in city of San Mateo, if we if we get called out by a resident and we actually determine the tree is a fire hazard, they actually will waive the permit fee. Um, so I can't speak to other cities, but I know that our city specifically does that, which I think is great because I think if it's something that needs to be removed and it's clearly a problem, then you shouldn't be charged for that. The second part of it, um, I agree with you. Um, I think it is pretty ridiculous to have to remove a bunch of trees from around your house, especially if you have a 5,000 foot parcel, which most of us do. Um, so actually a lot of the times I, what I tell folks that live in more of an urban neighborhood, because I get those questions a lot is, you know, oh, I've got to cut down my trees. No, 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 you do not want to cut down your trees. Trees are very healthy. They play a very important part in our environment. Um, and if they're healthy, they actually are naturally fire resistive. That's, I think, the piece that has gotten lost in this whole fire issue. And I know that I'm speaking to the choir here because you are master gardeners. But yes, we are not about cutting down trees for the sake of cutting down trees. There's, there's a very clear process that you have to follow. If it's disease or you think it might be disease, gain an arborist out there to look at it. Um, and then if you determine that it is disease or it's dying or it is actually a hazard at that point, you would get it cut. But for healthy trees, the recommendations are that you keep them pruned and maintained, well watered, and you limb them up at least five to seven feet off the ground. So those are the recommendations that I give folks. Also, any duff that falls off, cleaning that up, removing it from your gutters, from the valleys of your, um, your house's roof, those types of things. So just make sure that if you do have trees and they are close to your house, that they're just well maintained. Thank you, and thank you for <laughs> reminding everyone we're not just going to cut down all the trees. That's yes, so we don't we don't want that. <laughs> oh, now, now I feel like I have to chime in about my neighbors. Uh, actually, they they were like bushes, ligustrum, and they were like very very tall. So they weren't actual trees; they were just these bushes that had <laughs> overgrown. <laughs> we we don't think of you as a tree cutter down. Oh, <laughs> don't worry. Oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> I had to clarify that. 
So I do have a few more questions for everyone. What is the recommendation for replacement of a gate next to the home? Um, this is from Patricia. She has a gate built with wood on both sides of her house. Okay. So replacement for gate, um, it might be good if you're, if it's connected to the house, looking into non-combustible materials. Um, I know again that there's a, there's a, there's a product that's similar to Hardy board. And then also that the name's escaping me right now, but it's that actual, it's, it's not real wood. It's that fake wood. Um, it usually has like a, like a, some kind of a plastic or composite material in it. Trex. Um, Trex. Thank you. Trex. So that is an option as well. Um, I've also seen very creative, um, like iron gates, gates made out of metal. There are, there are options out there. You just have to look and see um, what those options would be. But yeah, just any kind of a non-combustible would be ideal. Um, thank you. Okay, the next question. The example landscapes seem to show wide swaths of lawn, not desirable in our area. Do we need to plant swaths of rock or are there good alternatives? Anyone want to take that one? I mean, I, I have some ideas, but I know that there's probably some gardeners that have done some pretty creative things with um, alternatives to lawn. Right. You might uh, look at uh, the different ground covers. There's so many. I know that we planted uh, carapia on the side of our house and uh, it has looked wonderful and it stays green year round and I never mow it. Yeah. I was going to say the same, Cynthia. I was going to say ground covers. There's a lot of great ground covers that are fire resistant that would work well. And can I ask a, a quick question? Um, a lot of people are putting in that that fake turf. It's you know like a plastic turf for instead of lawn. Is that combustible or is that safe during a fire? So anything that's it's funny that you bring that up because. That's actually not really come up very often, but yes, anything that's plastic is definitely combustible because um, it's made out of petroleum based products and petroleum, obviously oil and gas, and that's very combustible. Um, anything that actually plastics, when a lot of folks don't realize like it's actually pretty nasty when they do burn, they're actually worse than wood. So yeah, that, that me personally, I would not have any fake artificial turf near, if I had it, I wouldn't have it next to my home. I would have it away from my home. So if I did have a fire and if it does ignite or if it does like support combustion, it's not next to the house. And um, Lenny, I had also read about uh, those artificial turfs. Um, those artificial turfs, after they wear out, I don't know how long they last, but uh, they're also not biodegradable in our landfills. Yeah, they seem to be becoming more and more popular. And I feel like our towns should probably spread the word a little bit about the combustibility considering all the concern about fire. Interesting, thank you. So a couple more questions still. There's several have come in about permits within towns to take down trees and that some towns are actually allowing removal of eucalyptus and other unsafe you know, fire trees or fire propagating trees, I don't know how to say it, um, without permits. And then Joe was asking, are, is it, do we need permits to take down all trees or are there any other shortcuts to taking down some of the more dangerous trees? So I would recommend, depending on the city that you live in, speak with a city arborist. So every city has codes, municipal codes, usually governing what dictates a heritage tree. So it depends on where you are, but in our city, a heritage tree is any species 12 inches in diameter or more. So I would highly recommend if you're thinking about cutting down a tree, talk to the arborist and say, hey, what are your heritage tree? What does your heritage tree ordinance say? And that will give you the best information. And if it's under that, then you don't have to have a permit to cut it down. But yeah, I would definitely reach out, find out what the laws are. So you don't get in trouble. We wouldn't want you getting in trouble for cutting something down that was actually deemed a heritage tree and you just didn't know. Thank you. And the, the final question that's come through is who do we contact when we see dead trees on neighbor's property that have been sitting there for a long time? So that would be, it would depend on where you live. So again, I think the best place to start is your city arborist. If you live in an area that is a wildfire urban interface, so I'm, I'm assuming most of you folks live in San Mateo County. So most of your areas are gonna be affected, um, are gonna have wildland urban interface. The only exception, 
is really Foster City, which is in my district, but the rest of you are probably going to have wildland urban interface. And in that case, you would go to the fire department and ask them as well, because I typically get folks that reach out to me directly and say, hey, my neighbor's tree is dead. Come and take, come by and take a look. So what that process looks like is I get the complaint that comes into me. I go out and I, I'm not an arborist, so I can't make the determination, but I can tell if the tree is healthy or not. And depending on where it is, if it actually is a hazard, if I make that determination that it is a hazard, I will actually have our city arborist go out and actually make the call. And once the call is made, then we'll go and we'll contact the homeowner and, and they get the permit um, and the fees get waived at that point. Um, but that's just how my our process looks. I can't speak to the other cities, but yeah, usually usually the arborist or the fire department, either either or is a good bet. That's great. Thank you. And and I said that was our final question, but we do have one more, I believe. Um, <laughs> you guys are just a wealth of knowledge. So, um, Terry, I think you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Yes, I was wondering if you have stucco on your house, if you had a wood fence connected, if that would be a problem. So I actually have that on my house um, in Moss Beach. We have stucco with a wood fence. So it's not it's not as bad i think the bigger thing is looking at the roof and what material is over that area um if you've got just a straight wall that goes up with no windows or any penetrations any way that fire could get into the house i don't think that's as bad that's not as dangerous a condition but if you have like wooden eaves let's say and they're directly over the fence then we, we know from what we saw that that fire would potentially follow that that um, fall the fence back to the house, and now because fire the heat's rising, it could potentially go up into the eaves. So, I think it just depends on how the layout of the home is and where everything is located. But I think having it connected to a non-combustible surface is definitely much more safe than having it connected to a wooden house, for example. Okay, if there are wooden eaves yeah. but a non or a, a metallic roof, that's still a problem because of the wooden eaves. Yes. Correct. The wood is always okay. going to be the most, the weakest point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank yes. you. I would add, remember, you're thinking of what, what Melinda referred to as ladder fuels, things that can build up to one another feeding. And it isn't necessary for the, the fire to actually touch your home for your home to ignite. Radiant heat builds up. So anything mm -hmm. plasticky, i.e. the fake lawn or the vinyl, um, windows, for example, uh, think of the vinyl at, when it melts like, like lava. It holds a lot of heat, it carries it with it. That radiant heat can ignite the home and the fire can still be at some distance away. And then your home still burns. It's so scary. Thank you. Um, I think that we have asked all our questions. I'm gonna turn it back to um, Cynthia, unless I've missed something. No, everything is great. Thank you so much. I will also um, make a copy of, of this presentation and send it out with all the other things that, that um, I'm going to send you next. So thank you so much. And, and this provides a great references. This is what um, Master Gardeners referenced as we were um, examining the mulch and, and looking at the plants and, and, um, and especially the defensible space. Uh, these are all really good uh, resources for you to look at. So uh, we're going to close our meeting and, and we'll just visit for